Hi guys! Wandering the expanse of our favorite YouTube, I somehow came across a whole series of videos with crazy transformations of ordinary batteries into rechargeable ones. The work is just jewelry, and when I ran out of batteries, I couldn't refuse my curiosity and decided to try it myself. At the same time, let's see if it's real. And yes, a rechargeable battery is easy and cheaper to buy. We are engaged in technical creativity here, not saving the world. You shouldn't take this seriously. Ok, we opened the battery. I will carefully unfold the thermal film from the end so that later it can be rolled back. It was easier to just cut off the film, but I wanted to keep the original look of the battery. We get free access to the back cover. Then we need to make a hole in it with the help of wire cutters. This will give us access to the zinc electrode. Take it out. And then drill a bigger hole. I don't recommend you repeat these experiments, but if you do decide to disassemble batteries, be sure to wear gloves and goggles. There is a liquid alkaline electrolyte inside, and get it in on the skin will not be the most pleasant memory in life. Through the enlarged hole, it's now possible to remove the plastic plug and get access inside, from where we first need to get the remains of the anode. It's a zinc powder wrapped in a film. A black dense substance remained on the walls of the battery. This is a manganese oxide with some kind of binding component. It also needs to be removed. After, with a Dremel, I increase the inlet so that our future stuffing crawls through there. Having cleaned everything inside, we have such a metal sleeve. Now we can start making the filling. I decided not to solder on the weight as it was in the videos on YouTube. As an engineer, I'm more used to working with regular electronic boards. Since there isn't enough space to fit everything, I had to divide the boards into two parts, which I will connect with wires. To make the boards, I used a sheet of textilite, which is coated with a thin layer of copper on top. And since copper is a metal that can oxidize, I send off the oxide film before starting work. Then I degrease, primer it and print our etching mask on a UV printer. We will etch the copper, and this mask will serve as a protective layer under which the necessary metal tracks are kept. However, you'll see in a moment. This is how it looks. In addition, after lighting the mask in a UV lamp, I cut off the excess textilite with a regular office knife. And if you want to feel like a young chemist, here's the recipe for my compound. It's the safest way to use it at home. I lay all the components on a jeweler scale in an ordinary plastic container. First, I pour in hydrogen peroxide. Then the usual citric acid from the grocery store. Mixing. Then add the board. And then a pinch of salt. Next we have about a 30 second meditation session. Just look at this. It's fascinating, isn't it? When all the copper has dissolved, I rinse the board with water and remove the mask with the chloramethane. Thanks to it, the coating of the mask swells, becomes soft and can be removed with a cotton swab. Use a fume hood or charcoal respirator when working with solvent. Almost immediately after applying the chemical, the UV seal begins to react and peel away from my piece. After that, the mask can easily be removed with an ordinary cotton swab or napkin. After, degreasing and dipping the board in liquid tin. This will protect the copper from oxidation and make it easier for me to solder electronic components. With the help of a Dremel and a rasp, I give the final shape to the board. And now we can solder. Since the board had to be very compact to fit into the battery case, I had to cut some of the tracks below the electronic parts. I put electrical tape in the right places to prevent short circuits. Some components can get warm and have a heat output at the bottom, so it is not quite right to glue insulator. But first, my load is minimal, and according to the datasheet, overheating at such modes is out of the question. And secondly, I'm not making a serial product, it is just an experiment. For the same reason, I use this linear stabilizer. It consumes power in idle mode, which is extremely unreasonable for a battery. I should have a pulse converter like this, but I didn't have it at hand to the time of shooting, so we will test with what we have. Here the two boards turn out. Now I need to attach a battery to it. I'll use double-sided duct tape, 
We are testing a DIY project here, and what's a DIY if it doesn't have a tape? I am the DIY expert. And as is traditional in DIY, a little bit of magic. This is the stuff in the gut. Almost everything is ready to assemble. It reminds to put the finishing touches, the holes in the case for LED charging indicator, and the holes for the charging plugs. In the original video, the author used scotch tape and a stamp pad to transfer the connector outline. Well, I'll try to do the same. Luckily, I have the tape and a stamp pad. I cut with a blade along the contour and remove the film. This is needed so that the edge of the film at the hole isn't be rugged. I will mill the holes. To hell with the handwork! I fix the body in vice on a foam double-sided tape. It's a reliable fixation and protection of the case from the scratches. And gently mill. Perfect! Especially if finalize it with a rasp. Carefully stuff all the electronics inside. I hope nothing broke off in the process. It's not easy with such a hole. It seems to have worked out. The plus from the battery needs to be soldered to the iron case. As you remember, we made a hole in the back of the battery. So we need a donor. For the sake of the back cover, I dismantled the old 3A battery. Because it was able to get the part I need without damage. To this cover, I solder the minus from the battery. When installing, the main thing is not to short circuit. The back cover must not touch the case. So, I use epoxy glue which doesn't conduct electricity and carefully glue it all together. In the end, I give the thermal film its original appearance. As new! Reworking shows only the USB connector and the whole LEDs. Before we put the battery in any devices, let's check the current it produces, so that it doesn't spoil anything. The battery should have 1.5 volts. We check it, and it's 1.5 volts. That's all according to the standard. It's working! We did it! Let's charge our battery. To do that, we use a regular smartphone adapter. When charging, the indicator lights up red, and when completed, changes color to blue. Insert the battery into the clock, and it works! Woohoo! The complexity and unprofitability of such crafts I think you clearly saw. But how long would such a battery work for? The biggest battery I could fit into a battery case was this one, for 180 milliamps. If we look at the values of regular batteries, we see that even the weakest of them last 10 times longer. Ok, well, at least our is rechargeable. Maybe it's worth it? And no, it's not. Purchased analogs have a capacity of 10 and sometimes 14 times more than our batteries. And cost a lot less than what I spent on materials and time with this cool DIY project. Bottom line, it works, but it doesn't make any sense. So the project goes in the trash. Send in your ideas that you want me to repeat and test. And see you in the next videos! Oh yeah, be sure to check out our other videos, like this one or this one. That way you can help our channel grow. Bye!